September 21st is the anniversary of one of the bleakest moments in New York City history, the Great Fire of 1776. The fire started at around midnight and burned for 10 hours. When it was over, 496 structures stretching nearly one mile were gone, including Majestic Trinity Church. We're going to visit the part of the city destroyed by the fire and investigate how it started and by whom. We'll also learn about a second disastrous event for New York that was unrelated but occurred at the same time. We're standing here at Trinity Church near Wall Street, about the halfway mark from north to south of the path the fire took. It started to our left at Whitehall Street and continued to our right past St. Paul's Chapel and on to King's College. If we were standing here on the afternoon of September 21st, 1776, there would be devastation along the entire side of Broadway, across from us for two blocks behind the church and just about a half mile in each direction. How did it all start? The story begins near Francis Tavern on Broad Street near what was called the Exchange. So we're down here now across the street from Francis Tavern and the one thing that all first-hand accounts agree upon is that the fire started somewhere in the vicinity of the exchange and this this place we're standing here across from Francis Tavern this big plaza that was an open-air market called the exchange so first-hand accounts agree that it started on the other side of Broad Street so that might be right over there around where it says 90 today and or maybe that little uh, place where that Essen restaurant is and it started there and that from there it burned up to Whitehall which would be up that street between 90 and Essen and that it burned everything along Broad Street between here and Whitehall all the way up to our right to Beaver Street and that all of the structures in the interim there were all destroyed in the fire. Now, who exactly started the fire? Well, it's hard to say. Um, the British said that, you know, the people who lived in that building or tavern, if it was, were the disreputable type and maybe they started it. Um, a, a, a patriot in the town said it was much more likely started in that tavern by a group of sailors who got off of one of Admiral Howe's ship and had so much entertainment and were so overwhelmed with the enjoyment they were having that they accidentally set the building on fire. But all of the accounts do agree that it started here and that the wind blew it north along Broad Street. So all of the buildings on that side of Broad Street up to Beaver would have been engulfed by the flames and destroyed. We've walked up to Whitehall Street and we're looking down Bridge Street toward Francis Tavern where we were just standing. The fire came up here to Whitehall, turned to our left, and continued up to Beaver Street. That's where the first white building is on the right, after the black and green office building. Everything was burned between here and Broad Street, up to Beaver Street. Unbelievable devastation. But it was only getting started. When the flames reached Beaver Street, something unexpected happened. When the fire reached Beaver Street, right where you can see the sign for the Ann Taylor Loft, and by the way, the park I'm in, Bowling Green, was here at that time. It didn't continue up the east side of Broadway. Instead, the wind blew it across the street and the fire made its way up the west side, the side on our left. Incredibly, the fire bypassed the lower part of Broadway where some of the city's most beautiful colonial mansions were, facing the Bowling Green Park. The fire made its way up here to Trinity Church, burning a number of homes and taverns and the Lutheran Church, which was on the corner to our left. And it wasn't just the buildings on Broadway alone that were destroyed. The devastation continued for another block behind Trinity Church. Eyewitnesses said the massive steeple could be seen for miles around the city as it burned against the night sky. Why wasn't anyone able to put it out? The fire took the town by surprise. The bells that were normally used to warn the residents had all been taken by the American army. Remember, this is the summer of 1776 when the Battle of New York was moving through the area. They were all taken to be melted for musket balls. Also, the fire started sometime between midnight and 1 a.m. when everyone was asleep. Residents grabbed fire buckets, like this one, and filled them from wells, cisterns, and the Hudson River, but they were too small to stop a fire that had grown so large. 
By this time, the fire attracted the attention of the British Navy, which moved in and landed troops to try to stop the fire and to investigate. British accounts tell us that anyone found with any kind of incendiary device in their home, like coated matches, and nearly everyone had these items to light candles and oil lamps, were arrested on suspicion of arson, even if they were women. A few people were executed right on the spot, either by throwing them into the fire or shooting them and hanging their bodies up for display. Hundreds of people were arrested and charged. The British believed the fire was set by the rebels in the town and that they'd placed explosives in the cellars of the buildings and set them off in a sequence. But after a few years, even the British themselves admitted the fire was an accident and that it made little sense that the rebels, or patriots as we call them, would burn their own city. Well, how far did the fire go? Here at Trinity Church Graveyard, we are about halfway along the route. Let's go up to St. Paul's, where the fire was beginning to weaken. Here at St. Paul's Chapel, the fire was still burning and heading north. The street here, today called Fulton Street, then Partition Street, had every building burned. And remember, all of the area on the block behind the church, from Trinity to here, was also burning. Embers were flying everywhere, landing on buildings and setting their roofs on fire. But St. Paul's was saved, incredibly, by its flat roof. Men made their way to the roof where townspeople handed them buckets of water filled in the Hudson River. They used those buckets to put out any embers that landed on the roof. Meanwhile, water was poured on the grass throughout the graveyard and, incredibly, St. Paul's was saved. This is the same St. Paul's Chapel that stood that night in 1776. It was built in 1766, ten years before, and is one of the most spectacular historical sites in Lower Manhattan. The fire didn't have much further to go. By Barclay Street, a couple blocks to the north, it was dying, and nearby King's College, today that's Columbia College, located in northern Manhattan, was spared. The horrors of the night were over, and New Yorkers roamed the city the next day to see the destruction. Nearly 500 structures were lost, about one quarter of the city. And as if that wasn't horrible enough for New Yorkers, another event was unfolding north of the city at around 66th Street and the East River at the headquarters of British Commander General William Howe. The British had captured a spy a young American officer traveling in civilian clothes. He was from Connecticut, a member of Knowlton's Rangers. His name was Nathan Hale. Hale was spying that summer for General Washington and was captured by Howe's men. After a swift trial, he was sentenced to death. Nathan Hale, 21 years old, was hanged on September 22nd near the Dove Tavern. That's about 3rd Avenue and 66th Street today. We remember him as a hero whose last words were said to be, My only regret is that I have only this life to give for my country. This statue of Hale stands in City Hall Park as a remembrance of his bravery and of the bravery of all the young men who fought that summer in General Washington's army. Remember, that was an army that was never supposed to win. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you learned something new. Please like this video and my channel and tell everyone you know who loves history to please check it out. You can also follow my work on Patreon where I post a daily Revolutionary War story um, along with links and pictures and original documents to illustrate whatever I'm talking about. The link is in the description. And by the way, you don't have to be a paying patron to see those things. And of course, you can become a patron and see some extra things I post as well. Hope to see you soon for more of New York's great history. I'm Karen Q.